Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you our part two in our series for A Game of Thrones, the board game. Now this uh, is the second edition of the board game, so keep that in mind. I think that's pretty much what everybody has these days anyway. We're gonna be covering the gameplay, most of the gameplay, everything except for combat. So part one covered the setup, this will be the gameplay except for combat. Part three is gonna cover the combat, and then part four is gonna ex expand on some rules that didn't get covered um, in their entirety, I guess, or, or maybe j just needed some additional explanation. So before we get down the table, I do want to mention our sponsor, StoneValleyGames.com, which is your friendly, distant game store run by Eric and Wendy. They have a great selection of games over there. They have a focus on solo gaming because Eric did a lot of that while he was in the military. And then they also have new, new uh, hotness, old classics, you know, everything from you know, Azul to uh, Game of Thrones, all the way up to Magic the Gathering, everything you can think of, they've got it. So go over and check that out. They also have a loyalty program for returning customers. And if you are in the military stationed overseas with an AA, AP, or AE address, they will hook you up with free shipping. So go check out StoneValleyGames.com. There's a link in the description below. And now let's get down to the table and I'm gonna teach you how to play a Game of Thrones. The player screen provides reference information on the back as well as setup information here for each house. It also enables the player to sort and store components privately during the game. The game is played over 10 rounds and each round consists of three phases. The Westeros phase, the planning phase, and the action phase. After each action phase, a new game round begins starting with the Westeros phase. However, in the first round of the game, the Westeros phase will be skipped and players will begin with the planning phase. However, during this instructional video, I will teach the Westeros phase first since it is the beginning of most rounds. The first step of the Westeros phase is to advance the game round marker one position. If the game round marker is on the 10th round during the Westeros phase, then the game is over, at which point a winner will be determined. After advancing, the round marker, draw one card from each of the Westeros decks, and then reveal all three of them. Count the number of wildling icons, in this case there's three, and move the wildling marker that number of spaces. If the threat marker ever reaches 12, a wildling attack occurs. We'll discuss wildling attacks in part four of this video series. Also, this threat marker can never go above 12. So if it had started, say, here, and you had three wildling icons on the Westeros cards, the additional wildling icons wouldn't do anything. The marker stops at 12. Now, in order of deck number starting with one, resolve each revealed Westeros card. On the Westeros cards, players will find the event title, in this case, a Throne of Blades. This number indicates which deck the card belongs to. The effect of the card is found here. And if there's a wildling icon on the card, it will be found here. To resolve a Westeros card, simply read the card's text and implement its effects. Many cards are self-explanatory, but some require a detailed understanding of their specific effect. We'll take a moment to discuss these more complex effects now. The first Westeros card we'll look at comes from the one deck, and it is Supply, which requires you to adjust the supply track and reconcile armies. So let's take a look at House Baratheon. When they begin the game, they are on the two level of the supply track. This is because they have one supply here in Dragonstone and one supply here in the Kingswood. Let's say that at the time this card is drawn though, House Baratheon has spread its influence all the way to Blackwater. When the Supply Westeros card is drawn, the houses will in turn order adjust the supply track. For reference, I went ahead and put all of the houses starting supply positions on the track. Also as a reminder that they can be in the same position at the same time. So as I said, in turn order, the houses would adjust based off of their current supply situation and the territories they control. 
But say in this case, the only one to gain any new supplies at the time this card is drawn is House Baratheon. House Baratheon would now move up to level four supply. Each column on the track has a different number of flags beneath it. These represent the number of different armies and the max number of units in each army that a house may field on the game board. So now House Baratheon can have four different armies. Two of them may have three units and two of them may have up to two units. Remember that an army is defined as two or more friendly units in the same land or sea area. A single unit is not considered an army and has no supply consideration. So in this case right now, Baratheon has one two unit army here and a two unit army here, and then three individual units here. After players adjust their supply, they must ensure that the actual number and size of their armies on the game board do not exceed the supply limits. And if they do exceed the supply limits, they would have to remove units from the board immediately. So let's say, for instance, that House Baratheon had taken another spot and had been at supply five. And then the supply card was drawn and something had occurred and they were down to just four supply and so they shifted down. Now, they need to make sure they don't have more than four armies, which they don't. They have one, two, three armies and then two individual units here and here. But one of their armies has four units because of this allowance under five. And now that they're at level four, the max they can have for any of them is three. So they would have to remove one of these units from the board. It's important to note that siege engines and knights, while stronger than footmen, still only count as one unit for the purpose of these limits. It should also be noted that while it's entirely possible that armies will lose access to icons for supply or gain them throughout the course of playing the game, they only ever adjust their armies when a supply card causes them to reconcile how many supply they actually have. Of course, if a different game effect caused them to also adjust the supply track, it would be reconciled then as well. A player is never allowed to take an action during the game that would cause them to exceed their supply limit, even if they have taken over areas that will eventually give them a higher supply limit. They cannot do that until they have actually moved up the track. The next Westeros card we'll look at is also from the one deck, and it is Mustering. Recruit new units in strongholds and castles. When resolving the Mustering Westeros card, each player in turn order may recruit new units into each area they control that contains a castle or stronghold. House Baratheon currently has two such structures, a stronghold in Dragonstone and a castle in the Reach. Each castle or stronghold will provide mustering points, which may be spent to recruit new units in its area. Strongholds provide two points, and castles provide one. Footmen cost one point to recruit. Knights cost two points, unless a player is upgrading a footman to a knight, in which case it only cost one point. Ships cost one point, and siege engines cost two points, or a footman can be upgraded to a siege engine for one point. A mustard unit is taken directly from its player's supply and placed into the area where it was mustered. A footman in a mustering area may be upgraded to either a knight or a siege engine. A player may never muster a unit that would create or expand beyond their supply capabilities. As you can see, three, three, two, and two, three, three, two, and two. So House Baratheon is already at its maximum army size and quantity. If an area containing a castle or stronghold is unable to muster or upgrade a unit, or its owner decides not to muster or upgrade in this area, its mustering points are lost. Each player must resolve all of their mustering before the next player in turn order begins their mustering. Ships, just like any other unit, are mustered in areas containing strongholds or castles. However, they also must contain a port. Ships must be placed in a port connected to the mustering area or in an adjacent sea area. We'll discuss the ports themselves more in part four of this instructional series. Keep in mind though that a ship may never be mustered in an area containing an enemy ship. 
Also, as you might expect, if a castle or stronghold has no eligible location to muster a ship, then the ship may not be mustered there. It's also important to remember that two or more ships are considered an army, just like any other unit. The last Westeros card we're going to take a look at is from the two deck, and it is Clash of Kings, bid on the three influence tracks. To resolve this card, first, all of the influence tokens must be removed from the game board. Players will then bid available power for position on the tracks. The bidding is resolved one track at a time, starting with the Iron Throne track, followed by the Fiefdoms track, and finally, the King's Court. When bidding on each track, players first hide all their available power behind their player screen. Then, each player secretly places any number of their available power tokens into their hand in a closed fist. Once all players have made their selection, everyone simultaneously reveals their bid, opening their hand. The player with the highest bid places their token in the first position on the track. The player with the second highest bid places theirs in the second position, third highest in the third position, and so on down the track. The outcome of all ties in bidding is decided by whoever currently holds the Iron Throne token. All power tokens bid by players, regardless of the final outcome of the track, are discarded. Back to the power pool. After all influence tokens have been placed on the track currently undergoing bidding, the player occupying the track's first position is awarded its dominance token. For fiefdoms, it's the Valyrian Steel Blade. And for the King's Court, it's the Raven. After bidding for the King's Court track is completed and the Messenger Raven awarded, the Clash of Kings has been fully resolved and then the game continues. All remaining power tokens are returned to the front of each player's screen. The Iron Throne, associated with the Iron Throne track, allows its owner to break all ties in the game with the exception of ties in combat and ties determining the winner of the game. It should also be noted that the Iron Throne will not change hands after a Clash of Kings until the track is completely resolved. Ties in combat are determined by the player order in the Fiefdoms track. Also, the player who holds the Valyrian Steel Blade token is the person in position one, and that token allows the player once per round during combat to be granted a plus one combat strength bonus. When doing this, the player will flip the token over to its faded side to indicate that it has been used for this round. At the end of the action phase, it will be flipped back to its front and be ready for use once again. A house's position on the King's Court track determines the number of special order tokens available to the house during the planning phase. Special order tokens are marked with this star. The higher a house's position, the greater the number of special order tokens available. The number of special order tokens provided is indicated by the number of stars printed next to each position on the track. So positions one and two get three special orders, three will get two, and four will get one. We'll discuss special orders in more detail in the fourth part of this video series. It should be noted that in a three or four player game, this overlay will be used so that position one gets three, two gets two, and three gets one. The player in position one gets the Messenger Raven. The Messenger Raven allows the player to perform one of the following actions after the reveal order step of the planning phase. The holder of the Messenger Raven may replace an order by swapping one of their order tokens on the game board with one of their unused order tokens. The holder of the Messenger Raven may look at the top card of the Wildling deck, and then may choose to return to the top of the deck or place it at the bottom of the deck. They may share the information they found on the card with other players or even lie, but they may not actually show the card. Either way, once the player has used this token, they flip it to the faded side. During the action phase, it will then be flipped back to the front to be used again. After finishing the Westeros phase, players will enter the planning phase, which consists of three steps, assign orders, reveal orders, and use the Messenger Raven, which of course is optional. During the assign order step, each player must place exactly one order token face down on each area they control that contains at least one of their units. All players place their orders simultaneously. Also, an area can never be assigned more than one order token. 
Players may not reveal their placed orders to other players at all. However, they are free to plead, cajole, and or suggest strategies to each other during this step. They're even free to say exactly what they're playing or lie about it, but they may not show what they're playing. There are five different types of order tokens. Raid, March, Consolidate Power, Defense, and Support. Keep in mind that any order token that has a star is a special order token. A player may use any of their 10 regular order tokens during the planning phase, but may only use a number of special order tokens equal to the number of stars printed next to their position on the King's Court influence track, as we mentioned previously. After all players have completed placing their orders, they proceed to the reveal orders step. On very rare occasions, it's possible for a player to have fewer order tokens than they need. In this case, all players must take the assign order step in turn order. The first player places all of their orders face down as normal on the game board, followed by the next player in turn order, etc. During the reveal order step, players simply reveal all of their orders. And finally, if the player holding the Messenger Raven wishes to use it, they can do so at this time. After completing the planning phase, players then move into the action phase, which has four steps. Resolve raid orders, resolve march orders and combat, resolve consolidate power orders, and clean up. To resolve raid orders, in turn order, each player resolves one of their raid orders on the game board. If a player has no such orders remaining, they simply skip any further action during this step of the action phase. Players will continue cycling turn order in this way until no raid orders remain on the board. When resolving a raid order, a player simply chooses one enemy support, raid, or consolidate power order adjacent to their raid order. In this case, House Baratheon might choose this raid order for House Lannister. The chosen order and the resolved raid are both removed from the game board. By raiding an enemy's orders, players are effectively canceling opponent's orders. If a raid order is used to remove an opponent's consolidate power order token, the raiding player is said to have been pillaging his opponent. After resolving the raid order, the pillaging player receives one power token from the power pool and their opponent must discard a power token if possible. However, the pillaging player will always gain their one power token even if the opponent has none available to lose. A raid order placed on a land area can never raid an adjacent sea area. However, a raid placed on a sea area may raid a land area as well as an adjacent sea area. Raid orders are able to remove special order tokens as long as they match one of the legal types. If there is no eligible adjacent enemy order token when resolved, then the raid order is removed without effect. When resolving a raid order, players may choose to resolve it with no effect even if there is an eligible target. For the resolve march order step, in turn order each player resolve one of their march orders on the game board. As usual, if a player has no such orders remaining, they simply skip any further action during this step. And players will continue cycling through turn order, with each player resolving one march order at a time until no march orders remain on the game board. Resolving march orders is one of the most important aspects of the game. It is during this step that players move units, engage in combat, and gain crucial territory needed to fulfill their ambitions. A player may move all, some, or none of their units from the area assigned the march order. Units may move together into a single area, like this, or they may move separately, some into this area, some into this area, like this. You may leave units behind to hold on to a area. However, when moving units, they must move into an adjacent area only. The exception is when using ship transport, which we'll discuss in the fourth part of this video series. Footmen, knights, and siege engines may never move into a sea area. Likewise, ships may never move into land areas. 
While a player is free to split their units up into multiple areas by marching, they may only ever use a single march order to march on one area containing an enemy. So the player could not march here and also here. When a player moves one or more units into an area containing units from another house, they have started a combat as the attacker. We'll discuss combat in part three of this video series. Before resolving combat, all other non-combat movement must be resolved. Before resolving combat, all other non-combat movement from the area which the march originated must be resolved. The number printed on each march order token signifies the combat strength modifier provided to the attacking player when a combat is initiated with that march order. If a player completely vacates an area as they did with Blackwater here, they lose control of that area unless they leave behind a power token from their available supply. Details on controlling areas will be covered in the fourth part of this video series. A player may stagger movement by placing multiple march orders in adjacent areas and moving from here to here and then here to here. During the Resolve Consolidate Power Orders step, in turn order, each player resolves one of their Consolidate Power Orders on the game board. This will be done in the same manner that the previous two steps were, in turn order, until no one has any Consolidate Power Orders left. When a player resolves a Consolidate Power Order, they remove the token to gain one power token, plus an additional power token for every power icon on the board in the area where the order was given. So in this case, they would gain two power tokens. The final step of the action phase is the cleanup step. At this point, all remaining support and defense order tokens are removed from the board. Any routed units are stood up. The Messenger Raven and the Valyrian Steel Sword are flipped back to their ready sides. And the action phase is now over. If this was the end of the 10th round of the game, the game is over. Otherwise, proceed to the next game round with a new Westeros phase. The game will end in one of two ways. Either the game reaches the end of the 10th round, or a player will end the game immediately if they gain control of their 7th castle or stronghold. Throughout the game, players must at all times be tracking exactly how many castles and strongholds they have on this victory track. This is vitally important since any player who reaches 7 immediately wins the game. However, if the game ends at the end of the 10th round, however, if the game ends at the end of the 10th round, the player highest on the victory track will be the winner. If two or more players are tied, then the tied player who holds the greatest number of strongholds wins. If there is still a tie, then the tied player with the higher position on the supply track wins. If there is still a tie, then the tied player with the most power wins. And in the extremely rare case that there is still a tie, the tied player who is in the highest position on the Iron Throne track wins. And that is part two of our Game of Thrones, the board game, second edition instructional series. Be sure to come back for part three where we'll cover combat and part four where we'll cover all of those additional rules that just didn't fit neatly into any of these other videos. Also keep an eye out for upcoming videos for Waste Nights and Australia. We've got Lands of Gauzer coming, lots of great stuff, Dungeon Universalis. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.